there is no way anybody can guarantee ourselves that what we do will actually happen, the, the constructive action will happen. But in spite of that inspiring yourself and saying, I will go ahead and do it, is what is leadership? And there is no difference between exercising leadership and just being ordinary. So leadership to me in this construct, in this context is mobilizing all of you in this room for the collective action of learning leadership and clearly inspiring myself with the fact that I may not know whether you learn by tomorrow evening or not. Despite that, can I inspire myself? So everything you do, if you define it, it's about mobilizing a community or a group and their resources for doing something societally constructive amid enormous uncertainty. So what is societally constructive? My cell phone, I'm going to keep it. I took a cell phone, is it okay or not? Why not? Can I take it or not? I found it here, can I take it or not? Why not? So what may, if it belongs to him, so what? I can't take it. That would be stealing. And why, why is stealing wrong? Who told you stealing is wrong? Well, but if someone follows you, like, you're setting up a bad example. So what? I don't care. I get the phone. What is wrong if I take it? Why do you think it is wrong? All of you believe it's wrong? How many of you believe it's right or wrong? How many of you believe it's right that I can take his phone? How many of you believe it's wrong? So if I was concerned, I can take it. If I was concerned, I can take it. So most of you feel it's wrong or all of you feel it's wrong. But why? Where did that sense of wrong come in your mind? So because if everyone does the same thing, there will be a lot of chaos. So why aren't we doing it? So what is right and what is how do you how do you decide it is wrong? That's the point I'm asking. Because both of your opinions are not aligned when it comes to that action. So I take this, you say it's not aligned, I, I can't take it. He doesn't want you to take it, still you take it. Okay, I don't like to pay taxes, the government still takes it. <laughs> <laughs> so is it right or wrong? Huh? Eighteen percent GST, my God, they're screwing up my life now. I will not pay. I don't want a bill. I go to a shop, I say, bill beda, I don't want a bill. The values, right? The values. So, and, and where do these values come from? Our parents. So if you, what if your parents were wrong all their lives? Yes, and you were learned the wrong stuff then? Yes. So it's okay? No. Huh? The <laughs> huh? system that, is being, that I got hmm. decides, tells me that that is wrong. So, that means again it's very relational. What if your value system was wrong? The value system that Hitler had was the Jews are the worst in the world. Yes, yes. The same thing, right? In Syria, the value system is wrong, right? I don't know. Maybe it's right for uh, Bashar. So value systems are wrong. So how, what is right or wrong? That's what I'm trying to understand. Who decides right and wrong? Huh? Right wrong is a relative. So okay, what is right or wrong for him is right for me. Okay, I take it. It, it is wrong for him, it's right for me. Sir, it disturbs the accepted social norm. So there's something else. That means norms are societally driven and not deeper than that. So society changes, norms can change. Right? If there is a consensus, consensual So we are all, see how, how fascinating. None of us have really thought on right and wrong, but we all follow a generalized code of right and wrong. You go to a shop, you buy something, you simply pay. You can walk off. Sometimes you might have felt like walking off, I don't know. <laughs> or sometimes he, he gives you more change. Some of you may not even notice it, you may pocket it and go off. You go home, suddenly find five rupees extra. And you're struggling, where did the five rupees extra come from? Some of you may say, oh, it must have come from the shop, that only purchase I did. You may come back and give it. Yes. Some of you might do it, some of you say, ah, going back itself is 10 rupees, no, why bother? <laughs> and you may keep it. We are all, right? And then we say, what to do? Going back was 10 rupees, that's why. Giving back five rupees, spending 10 rupees, not worth it. Some of you say, I'm standing at the signal light, right? And uh, no traffic, nothing. And uh, it says red, and you say, well, you look around and say, nothing is coming, <laughs> go. You don't think about it, and we don't think it's right or wrong. So what is right, what is wrong? How do we decide right and wrong? Because leadership is a constant demand of actually determining right and wrong. And it is relational, it is value driven, but how do you, how does your brain decide what is right and what is wrong?
So let's go a little deeper. And so I'm going to spend the next few minutes. So th that is called moral reasoning. How do you decide what is moral? Because leadership is constantly standing in judgment of morality. And some of you might have heard this example. I'm going to repeat that example. So imagine, um, this is an imaginary thought, thought exercise, OK? It's a very imaginary thought exercise. Imagine a train engine. <laughs> This is an engine and I'm giving you data and the first condition of this thought game is, simulated game is, you will have to only work with the data I give you, okay? Which means I'm conditioning you to think with only with data points I give you. Now leadership, the challenge of leadership is we have, go, life is always going to be about basing your decisions on inadequate, incomplete and inconsistent data. All your lives are going to be challenged by it. Don't think that everybody is going to come with a perfect set of data sets and say give me an answer. Then you don't need leadership, you need a machine for that. Leadership is constantly working with inadequate, inconsistent, incomplete data sets and still taking the possibly right call. And it's a, it's a game and there's no certainty that you're taking the right call. And that is the beauty of leadership. It begins with faith like Vivekananda said. Deep faith in yourself and conviction that you might possibly try to do good and inspiring yourself despite the fact that you may not be doing good. I may not be doing good by teaching leadership for you, but I must have the faith that 30, 35 of you, at least 10% or 20% of you might carry this for life and get transformed and make this world a better place. Let's carry this exercise forward. This is an engine which is traveling at 80 kilometers per hour speed. Okay, this is the data I'm giving you. And this engine, you are the engine driver. And I am telling you as an engine driver, that you have no brakes and your horn is not working. So you know it. You know, you're dri you're ri ri driving the engine at 80 kilometers per hour speed. You have no brakes, you have no horn. And you're seeing in this railway track, five people, you, you see on trains, they'll be cleaning up the track, they'll be putting this jelly, the stones, and removing all that uh, grass that grows and all that, right? And now the rail Indian railways has improved a bit. So they give earmuffs for the workers now. So they are all wearing earmuffs. They can't hear anything. And they are facing this side. The engine is coming from behind. OK? What's going to happen now? You're going to kill all five, right? But I'm giving you additional data points. I know you can't turn an engine like a car. but. <laughs> For a minute, imagine you can turn that engine. And there's one man working on this track. Now, as an engine driver, you have a very simple choice you have to make. And there are only two choices. You, you have to exercise one of them. To kill one person. Has yeah, I know he's got it, right? You can either turn left and kill one, or you can go straight and kill five. Now, how many of you in this room, how many of you in this room are ready to go straight how many of you in this room are ready to turn left? I gave you a very simple choice. You got my question? Nothing to think about, right? You have only two simple things. You can either go straight or you can go left. That's all you can do. You have no brakes, no nothing. So it's very simple. You are going to kill one, you have to kill anyway. You have to kill one or kill five. So how many of you are willing to go straight? Data is inadequate. Like what happens to the track afterwards? I, I, I told you. How difficult it is to convince yourself to just do what I say. Yeah? <laughs> I said you will work with the data I give you. I have made all these preconditions before it's all very clear. Your data is very simple. You can either go straight or go left. So your choices are very simple. I'm giving you very little choice. Go straight, kill five, go left, kill one. How many of you will go straight? <laughs> I just gave you data now. That's all the data I've given you. Will you go straight or go left? You'll go left. Now ask, what's your name? As Deepti is about to turn left, Deepti is a 45-year-old mother of a only child, and she's operated herself. She can't have children anymore. She's about to turn left. She notices it's her son playing there. Will Deepti turn left or go straight? And honestly answer this question. Believe you're a 45-year-old woman with a 10-year-old child, and you can't have children anymore. And you have this choice of going straight or turning left. What would you do?
that is a truthful answer. Suddenly, five minutes ago she was okay with killing one, now she is okay with killing five. So, what is right, what is wrong? <laughs> Life is always about choices and leadership is always about exercising those choices. So, Deepthi Exa is a choice, it is her choice. Now, is she right or wrong? It is, is it wrong it? one and wrong two. <laughs> <laughs> Let me make things a little different and a little better for all of you. Now, everything is the same, okay? nothing has changed. This is a little more imagination. You are not the engine driver, but you know that engine driver cannot stop the train because he is travelling at 80 kilometers at speed, his brakes do not work, his horn does not work, that is the information I have given you. You already know that, but you are standing on top of a bridge here. and you are watching that engine go by. So, what are you going to watch? Five people dying, simple right, five people getting killed. Now, you also have a fat man standing beside you, and this is real imagination. And I am giving you data that you are capable of pushing this fat man down, and when you push him, the in engine hits him and stops exactly here. So, fat man dies, but five people you are saving. Now, how many of you are willing to push this fat man down? Two, three, three of you are willing to push the fat man down. Now, I give, work with the data I gave you. Just work with the data. Just imagine, five minutes ago, three minutes ago, everybody in this class wanted to turn left. And why? Because you said, or one of them said, why, why would you have preferred to turn left at that time? To save five lives, right? Five lives, killing five people is worse off than killing one person, utilitarian, right? So, kill one person is better. Now, also I am asking to do the same thing, kill one person, five people will be saved and rest of the class does not want to do it, only three people want to do it. Suddenly, your sense of values have all changed, your logic has changed, your rational has changed, you still can save five people, no? Yes. Why is the rest of the class not doing it? What changed? I am telling you, I am giving you data, certainty, he will, the train will stop, the five will survive. Why are you not able to push the fat man? You, only three of you said, those who, those who did not push now. I did not tell you all that, I did not tell who they are even. Wonderful. So, in the second, first case, you do not feel you are causing death, whereas in second case, you are, in the first case, you are the agent, but here you are the principal and why cannot you kill him? Because deep down, you are subscribing to a value that I have no right to take away life, right? In some way in your mind, there is a tacit implied thought that I cannot take away life, life is not provided by me, so I cannot take it away. Now, in the first case, when you are willing to turn left and five people could survive because of you, that is because you are what we call in the moral reasoning framework as consequential reasoning. You think of consequences first. The consequences of saving five lives is better off than killing one person. For deep tea, the consequences of losing her only child and she can never have a child again is worse off than the five people dying. So, she thinks of consequence and her husband will possibly throw her out of house, maybe she will have to live with the guilt all her life. The consequence of leaving the, the guilt of killing your child versus killing five people, which is lesser you think, assuming deep is normal, right? So, consequences for her is too much to bear and so she chooses those consequences. When you are standing at a signal light, it is red and no traffic is coming, the consequence of breaking the red light and traveling, when no lorry is coming on the other side, there is nothing no consequences. The consequence of I taking 100 rupees bribe from him to move his file, nothing happens to me, right? So, why should I not take? But if I do not take, 
I can't buy the new phone for myself, I can't buy a motorcycle for my son, I can't buy a chain for my wife. So what do you think I will do? I'll take the 100 rupee bribe. So the other reasoning where you say I will not kill, it is not my choice to take away life, I will not kill is called categorical reasoning. I am categorically clear, I will not kill. Some of you will stand at a signal light, it will be red, the car fellow behind will be horning because nothing is coming, you will still not move. Because you are categorical, I will follow the rules, it is red light, I will not go. Some of us are categorical reasoners, some of us are consequential reasoners, some of us while exercising leadership, I will tell you how we reason later, okay? just understanding the base of moral reasoning. So I want to end this with a question and we can come back and answer after tea. This actually happened in UK, in London, okay? 100, 150, 200 years ago, UK was considered to be the queen of the seas, right? The UK Navy, that's what they called themselves. Whether they really were or not, they thought that. So for every young boy, what was his dream? To become a sailor and to go on the voyages and to go on the ships. So there's a young 17-year-old man, orphan boy, who had no job, vagabond, walking around the streets, stealing here and there, some are living life. Somebody tells him, why are you wasting your life? Go join a ship as a sailor boy. Sailor boys were the ones who clean the toilets, get the food for the captain, all this janitor kind of a work. So go join, six months you go on a voyage and come back, you will get a lot of experience, you get paid, your life will be worthwhile, you will learn some values and then you can come and take a good job. So the boy joins the ship, the ship sets sail. Within a 10 days of the ship going to sail, it is hit by a storm and the ship capsizes. So a lot of people jump into the lifeboat and they all try to escape. And the last lifeboat that people jumped on, the captain normally those days, the captain is the last person to, he makes sure everybody has left the ship safely and then he goes right. So the captain and the first mate, first mate means the immediate assistant of the captain, who is the one who is the executive, he does all the decisions. Captain takes decisions, but somebody has to get it done, right? He is the executive. So he is the first mate, he is the executive. And one sailor, sailor is the actual fellow who is putting up the sails and all that. And the sailor boy, are the only four people in the last ship, the last boat. And there is some food in the boat. Every sail, every lifeboat has got some food for a few days. So the food lasted them four days. Fourth day, food is over. So two days, they didn't eat anything. They are all weak. Six days now they are in the ocean. This actually happened. They are very weak. No food, no water, everything is over. The captain tells the other three, please be careful, don't drink, whatever happens, don't drink the sea water. However thirsty you are, don't drink sea water. Now he's a veteran of sailing for 30, 40 years. What do you think will happen if you drink say, uh, uh, sea water on an empty stomach? Dehydrate. Wonderful. You, say, you, you dehydrate, you vomit, you puke, you have diarrhea and you lose all your electrolytes and you will die. So if the captain knows it, he says, so one more day they pass, they are somehow holding on. Eighth day, night, this boy can't stand the thirst, the first voyage, he goes and drinks all the sea water. So next day, both ends open and he's fully dehydrated, nearly dead, in, in and out of coma. Two minutes he's uh, conscious, then he again becomes unconscious, so he's about to die. Maybe he may he will die in three, four hours. Before this actually happens on the eighth day, the captain says there is no way we will survive. So let us put our names and pull straws. Uh, whoever takes the shortest straw, they close their eyes and stretch out to a straw, we'll, we will kill him, drink his blood, eat his meat, we will survive for three, four more days. And then again pull straws. Whoever dies, again and the three, four days. So finally, this chance that one fellow at least will survive. Let's do that. What do you think everybody will say? They all will agree to that? Unlikely, right? Most of them didn't agree. No, no, let's not kill. Let's all either we survive together or we die together. This is a nice story. So they, they didn't do that also. So nobody is willing to agree that somebody can be killed. This boy, the next day he develops diarrhea. It becomes so bad, the captain then says, 
kill the boy. The first mate kills him. They drink his blood, they eat the boy's flesh and they live for till the 13th day. 13th day a ship finds them, they are brought back to London. Now they come back to London, the sailor complains to police and says the captain ordered murder and the first mate committed it and this is what happened and the police arrest him, arrest the captain and everybody, all the three are arrested. Now the court com case comes to court, imagine you are the judge. Ha, the newspapers, no, we are in, in, like in our country, in London also, the trial by the newspaper. The media trial was that fellow should be honored and given an award. The boy was about to die, he is an orphan, he was nearly in coma. This captain had the intelligence to save three lives. Instead of rewarding him, you are putting him into jail. So, the whole country's media was against it. People were debating how can you kill him? He should be given a medal. But the police, the sailor turned approver, so he was going to be pardoned, he was going to give witness in court and the case is finally coming to the judgment day and you are the judge. Now will you acquit the captain and the first mate and give them an award or will you convict them and send them for, a, give them a death sentence, what will you do? 